verse 1. And I'm just going to mosey along here tonight. I'm not going to get in much of a rush. So don't be thinking about the clock. I don't expect to preach three or four hours, but I might go, I might go a little bit here tonight. So y'all bear with me, okay? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we find in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. It's been said that this word created is a verb associated only with God in Scripture. This word speaks of that which only God can do. It also signifies something new or remarkable being established from absolutely nothing. Job 26, 7 speaks to this when it said, He, this is speaking of God, stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. This in mind we find in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 again. Let's read it again. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And so let's think about this. There was nothing tangible, nothing physical. Now there was something now after God began to speak and God began to create, there was something that now had natural qualities. Verse 2 continues on with, the earth was without form, void, darkness was upon the face of the deep, Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So I'm going to stop right there and pray and I'm going to let you sit down. Lord, I'm asking you to minister tonight in a powerful way. I'm asking you to help us to receive your word with meekness. Let it become engrafted into our hearts let us grow from this word, Lord. Let us become more than we were before we, when we first got here tonight. I pray it in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. In verse 6, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. So now you've got water down here, you've got clouds up there. Verse 8, God called the firmament heaven, the evening and the morning were the second day. And then God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth and gathering together the waters called he seas and God saw that it was good and God said let the earth bring forth the grass, the ye herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so. The earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And, and again, God saw that it was good. Expositor writes here, there are two points in verses 11 and 12 that refute evolutionary order. First is that plants were created before animals. Secondly, the earth brought forth grass immediately. The second point suggests that the earth was created in mature fashion rather than evolving over eons. So I'm going to let you think about that a little bit. Verse 13 then puts a wrap on day three when it said in the evening and the morning were the third day. Verse 14 God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light 
upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. I'll tell you what, if, man, can you, I'll tell you what, how would you like to have a seat in that, in that theater where you're just watching all of this stuff taking place? Amen. And in verse 19, the evening and the morning were the fourth day, and God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath light and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And, and God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after his, their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And again, God saw that it was good. And, and then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them <coughs> have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And again, it was so. <clears throat> and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he has made. And it, it wasn't that he was worn out. It wasn't that he was weary with creating. It was that it was finished and there was an example in there that he wanted us to abide by. In other words, there was a day where we were supposed to rest in the Spirit. And that's what, of course, we do on Sundays. We come together and we rest in the Lord. Hallelujah. But really, it's even more than that because now we have, we have the Holy Ghost living within us. And really, that is the great rest. Because every single day, in, in a way, is the Sabbath. Because we carry the Holy Ghost with us wherever we go. Amen. So on the seventh day, God ended his work which he made. He rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now one key to understanding the creation account is the whole of creation was not an instantaneous finished product. No, God had a plan, and his plan carried with it order. There was an orderly process. There was a way that things flowed. In human terms, the best way I could come up with 
to describe creation is the eternal composer created a symphony in seven parts. Each of these parts took 24 hours to play out. And, and here's the thing. The composer not only wrote the symphony, but he also created the instruments in the form of miracles so the symphony could be performed and, and not only be performed, but be perfectly performed. I don't know how many of you have ever been to a symphony, but when you're 14 years old in high school, whatever it was I was in, they bring you to the symphony, you're not all that excited. But the older you get when you go to a symphony, you understand that this isn't just something that's thrown together. There is order present in that symphony hall. Each part has to be played as precise as a human can play it, it has to be played in time. When, when, when the cymbal guy claps his cymbals, there's only, he only gets one shot at it. He can't come back and say, can I do that over again? No. If he messes up, everybody's saying, man, what a mess this has been. And so everything has to be played skillfully. And friend, when the Almighty Symphony was composed, was performed and played, notice how God, I mean, responds to his own work. He again says, man, this is very good. My point again is there was order to creation. First came substance. However, the substance was without form. It was void, but... But then came the ordering process. There's so many examples in Scripture. There are examples not only of order, but there's, order, there, there's examples of disorder. For instance, God told Abram, I'm going to give you a son. We know that time passed, a whole lot of time passed, and they became impatient, and along comes an Ishmael. And now we find rampant chaos to this very... I'm talking about today there was chaos in our nation because they got ahead of God. What did they do? They went against God-ordained order. How about Jonah? God told him, go to Nineveh, preach to Nineveh. Jonah took the scenic route. He ends up in the belly of the God-prepared fish. However, before God was done, this man was in full-blown chaos. And what did that chaos do to him? It drew, drove him to repentance. And it was only then that this fish threw Jonah up on the shores of the very place that he told him to go in the first place. And guess what? Now he's finally willing to do the will of God. God in turn saves the entire city. I'll say it again. Order matters where God's concerned, where we're concerned. When the Apostle Paul named and defined the gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, tongues of edification, prophecy, there was also a God-ordained order to how these were to function. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40, shared the distilled direction for the usage of these gifts. When Paul writes these words, wrapping up the explanation here, he said, let all things be done decently and in order. It's like going to that symphony if... if if the horn blower blows at the wrong time, it messes the whole thing up. Again, if the cymbal player claps at the wrong time, the whole thing gets messed up. If the, if the orchestra director, he directs, he directs the wrong direction, does something the wrong way, again, everything is affected because someone was out of order or something was out of order. Well, amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so, again, let all things be done decently and in order. The point being there was and still is a way for these heavenly inspired gifts to be used. Yet again, 
the instruction for their usage is found in this one word, order. You see, without order, order, there can be nothing but chaos. God began with order. He continues with order. He will continue to be a God of order. There's to be order in the body of Christ. Amen. There's to be order in the home where our natural families are concerned. There's again to be order where the gifts of the Spirit are concerned. There's order where the receipt, receipt of the new birth is concerned. For instance, you don't get the Holy Ghost first. You've got to repent. You've got to say, Lord, I, I'm a sinner. I, I've, I've messed up, and I'm asking you to forgive me. And, and when we do that, that barrier that, that prevents God is removed, and, and now we don't have to wait to be baptized, but at some point we need to be baptized we can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because we followed an order. We got rid of the sin. God, God forgave. He removed the obstruction. And now we can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, God's Spirit living within us. There's even an order concerning how humanity deals with authority here on earth. You know, you, you know, police officer comes to stop you. You know what my dad always told me to say? He said, you tell that man, yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. He said, well, what if they speak to me rudely? Well, maybe they're having a bad day. You know, let them go and get about their, get, a, get, get. I'm not going to be the one that's going to mess it up even further. Does that make sense? So let's look back at something that, really shows how much God cares about order. Let's go to the tabernacle site. This site was built according to precise specifications. Everything was laid out according to the divine order. In the outer court, if you've ever had a Bible study, you'll remember this. The outer court, there was first found the brazen laver or the place of sacrifice. Next came the brazen laver. There, this was a pool of water where the priest washed just prior to entering into the holy place. In this holy place, directly to the left, we find the seven golden candlesticks that lit the whole interior of the holy place. In the middle of that holy place was found the altar of incense that was lit up twice a day that brought sweet smells into the tabernacle site. To the far right, there was the table of shoe bread, and, and this was a part of the diet of the priest as they ministered in that tabernacle. Next came the veil separating holy place from the holiest of holies, and, and it was behind this veil that dwelt, where dwelt the Ark of the Covenant, and in the Ark there were the tablets of stone the tablets of the law, the golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod or walking stick that budded or bore leaves after it was dead. Above the ark there was the mercy seat where the blood of the pure spotless animal was sprinkled that dealt with the sins of the nation. Again, we've got order. We've got order. Facing the front of the tabernacle site was Moses and Aaron, directly behind them came the tribes of Issachar, Judah, and Zebulun. From the front of the tabernacle to the right were the priests known as the Mirites. Directly behind them were the tribes of Asher, Dan, and Naphtali. From the front of the tabernacle to the left were the priests known as the Kohathites. Behind them were the tribes of Simon, Reuben, and Gad. To the rear of the tabernacle site were the priests known as the Gershonites. Behind them were the tribes of Manasseh, of Ephraim, of Benjamin. I want you to think about, I mean, you're talking about a massive group of folk. If there was an order, it would have been nothing but chaos. But there was order. You know, they would pick up and move, but... But everybody knew where they were supposed to go. Everybody knew what they were supposed to do. 
Understand this, church. The entire tabernacle site screamed order. Again, I want to read it. 1 Corinthians 14.40, let all things be done decently and in order. And this order is to flow into every single area of the child of God's life. You say, well, I might, I've got a little turmoil here. Well, it's not going to be because you're, you're, you're not living an orderly life. No, you're going to do it God's way. And when the old world tries to encroach on your life, it's not going to take you very long to, to find that orderly life again, that orderly world again. Why? Because you're living an ordered life. For instance, in Ephesians 5.22, let's talk a little bit about relationships. Paul writes here, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. A wife might decide one day, but I don't want to submit to my husband. I don't want my husband to lead me, to direct me, to guide me, to give me any direction. Wives, let me say it like this. You can do it that way, but you might want to pause and pray real hard here simply because there's a reason that God set the order like it is in our homes. Let's take a detour for a moment here. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, we find, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I'm going to make him and help me. Notice, Adam was not complete without another of his kind. Verse 19 next tells us, and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and, and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, to fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet, an aid for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. Really, he made an opposite and brought her unto that man. Where the man was strong, the woman was the weaker vessel. The man had one purpose. The woman had another purpose. The point being, the woman would complement the man where the man was lacking, the woman would fill that void. Where the woman was lacking, the man would take up the slack. Put the two together and you have a complete whole blending of two into an action that we call order. And then God brought this Eve. He delivers her to Adam. And listen to Adam's response in verse 23. He said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave or shall cling unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. Here's a key point. God wasn't giving man dictator status. Aren't you ladies glad about that? No, the husband had a role to play. The wife has a role to play. And when the two perform their God-given duties, what come for, comes forth is what God intended. A powerful force that can accomplish his will in this earth and I want you husbands and wives to know that God has purpose for you and it's about more than coming to church God's got people he wants you to influence he's got people that 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 he needs them to look at your marriage married lives and say my goodness we can have that and friends, if we've got order in our lives, in our marriages, I'm telling you, there's a whole lot of people in this world that don't have order in their marriage. And if they can see order, 
then they can desire order. And if they desire order, they may just begin to look at it through you. Does that make sense? So, husbands aren't to be dictators, but um, again, they're to play their role in the home. Husbands are really to set the course for the family. Wives are certainly to come into alignment with the husband, and yet don't forget the husband must cleave unto his wife. He needs her in order to be whole. I want to remind you that there was a part that was taken from man that can only be made whole by taking his wife and valuing her as he ought. Remember the rib was taken from the side of man? So what, what did he make that rib into? He made her into that man's wife. And so the only way that, they can become, that man can become whole again is to find that missing part. And when he finds that missing part, then he's got to value it enough to, to care enough about it, to treat it well, and to be everything that he needs to be for that missing part that has come back to him. The whole picture is one without the other is missing a key part of their God future and vice versa. This is why we see so many discontented men and women in our worlds today. We have men looking for their God-ordained missing part. At the same time, we have women looking for their God-ordained missing part. And here's the thing. We need each other. And until we find each other, there's always a void missing because God order is missing. Does that make sense? In fact, in verse 25 of our reading, we begin seeing more still about the balance between husband and wife as Paul continues on with these words. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I'll tell you what, husbands will treat wives properly if they understand that they're living in the physical, the relationship that the Lord Jesus has with the church. Wife says, well, my husband's not treating me right. Well, well there's, there's a problem there. Because I'm telling you, husbands are supposed to love their wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word that he may present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So can we see this? A man is not to mistreat his wife. He's to love his wife in this way. He's to love her as he loves himself. Now, guys, how do you love yourself? (laughs) How much do you love yourself? (laughs) Let me tell you about this relationship between husbands and wives. The man is to be the wife's protector. He's supposed to be her shoulder, her strong and steady partner. He's going to be there when the going gets tough. The wife is to be the man's supporter, his cheering section, his help, the one who balances him out, who keeps him him in that steady place. Not too high, not too low, but but she's going to be there as an encourager, as a help me. She's going to balance him out. The point is the two of you are to work together as one. You are to be simpatico, unified, heading the same way, achieving together, failing at times, but you're going to do it together, at times rebuilding together, at times standing strong in the face of adversity, but how together the two shall truly become one flesh. Doesn't mean you got to like fishing, ladies. Men, doesn't mean you got to like knitting. What this means is you blend your weaknesses and strengths because when you're blended, you're far better together than you could ever be apart. 
Amen. Hallelujah. This is why I made this point. The husband's job isn't to demand and command. It's to lead. If the wife is better at managing the money than the husband, yep. The husband should say, wife, you manage the money. We'll have a sit-down meeting every now and then just to make sure we're on the same page. But <laughs> Paul's also saying the husband is to lead not only in the natural but also in the spiritual. Somebody needs to wake up now. The husband should be a prayer. The husband should be a faster. He should covet the word of God. He should seek God's direction for the family. He should be under subjection to God always because remember how he lives. That's the example that the wife has. And if he's the proper leader, then she's going to follow that example. And if he isn't the proper example, chances are she won't. 99.9% .9 of the cases, if the husband is what he's supposed to be, the wife will be what she's supposed to be. Why? It's because there's order at work, and there's nothing in all the world God loves more than order. Now, there are times when one's doing everything they're supposed to be doing, and the other one is just, I mean, just doing the exact opposite. And what do you do there? Every day of your life, you pray. You say, God, I need you to help them. God, I need you to make them to see that they need to do better. But friends, if we've got order, we have a precious commodity. I'll tell you one thing about First Pentecostal Church, uh, West Bank. We don't have a whole lot of disorder at this church. We really don't. We are very blessed. And old devil, you just shut your ears right now. We're not going to start a bunch right now. But I, I'm just saying it's a precious thing when you've got order in the church that you attend, when you've got order in your home, when you've got order with your kids, when you've got order with life, when, when you're doing the right thing and you're in the will of God, there's nothing like it. When you're doing everything that you're supposed to do because... Lord, I've got to be in your divine order. I've got to be in your divine will, knowing that if I'm in your will, Lord God, everything else is going to be okay. So husbands are to do their God-ordained duty for these reasons. Ephesians 5, 30 said, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones for this cause again. Shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife again, even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. But even this isn't all. Chapter 6, verse 1 continues with children, obey your parents. I don't know where my kids are today. I think my kids are in Sunday school or, 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 or church, or back, uh, church for the young people back there. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You know, we got a whole lot of kids that haven't been raised in church in our world today that don't understand how they're supposed to treat parents. We got a whole lot of parents in the world today that don't understand how they're supposed to treat kids. But I'm telling you what, if we understood, we'd be working a whole lot harder at doing things right instead of just doing them our way. So children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. What's the promise? That your days may be long upon the earth. Verse 3, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth, and ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So I'm teaching about the importance of spiritual authority, spiritual order in the home. Without it, we're on our own. With it, God directs, God watches out for, God covers every aspect of our lives. God's point is this, order is one of the most important items in our walks with God. That's if we want to be blessed of God. I don't want God working against me. I don't want to be in the belly of the fish. No, 
I want to be doing the will of God because if I'm doing the will of God, I'm going to be blessed of God. All right? Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, we find something very interesting. We find the apostle giving a key directive to the Corinthian church concerning what we're talking about tonight, order. He writes here, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. In other words, Paul's saying, do what you've seen me do. I'm submitted to the Lord. As I follow him, you follow me. Verse 2, now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Here again, Paul is establishing order. Verse 4 then tells us, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. The expositor writes here, Paul turned his attention to the subject of hair as an outward symbol of empowerment through inward submission to God's order. A man who covers his hair with long, head with long hair dishonors Christ. Now you say, what does all this matter? Again, it's about God order. It's about God's ways. Verse 5, then said, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Verse 6, for if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Positor writes here, the woman finds her authority and signals her submission to her authority by covering her head with her long hair, by which she has power on her head and also demonstrates her voluntary deference to her husband and ultimately to God. The words used to describe her hair as a symbol of this divine arrangement are threefold. Number one, they are shaven, which indicates to completely cut off the head. Two, shorn, which indicates to cut regardless of length, and long, which in this context means to be neither shaven nor shorn. Verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Again, the expositor writes, whatever the full meaning of this verse is, the phrase because of the angels indicates that this subject of human order, authority, and power, including the symbols under discussion, are connected to the heavenly order. Only once is the word authority used in this entire passage here translated to have power and interestingly it is something which belongs to the woman. Paradoxically the woman's sign of subordination on the one hand is her sign of authority on the other. Paul had earlier shown angels to be interested observers of believers and even that believers will judge some angels. Paul here again connects believers to things heavenly, knowing that the believing woman's compliance in this rather simple matter of uncut hair transcends practical issues. However, this should not be totally unexpected as the entire discourse began with discussion of universal order and the lofty and sacred alignment of man and woman in this order with God himself. This discussion also made it clear that everything has meaning in the life of the believer, whether of the body, soul, or spirit, and whether of action or appearance. 
This reiterates to the believing woman that the one's whole person, that is body, soul, and spirit, are holy unto the Lord and are vessels upon which rests and out of which flows divine glory. Treatment of every aspect of individuality thus takes on sacred significance. Whether actions or appearance, practical or symbolic, she is at all times the temple of God. Hallelujah. Husbands, men, we need to be holy before the Lord. Ladies, wives, we need to be holy before the Lord. And so when we look at things in the Word and we see words like order, we're supposed to take those things very, very seriously. In 1 Corinthians 11, 11, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things are of God. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? The point here is gender distinction was emphasized due to the fact that both male and female are required to fulfill the image of God. Verse 15, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. A woman's long hair means unshaven, unshorn, a woman's long hair is a glory, meaning glory or radiance given her by God. It also testified to her sanction of government in her life. Whatever the cultural tradition of the time was concerning veils, Paul made it clear that for a Christian woman, her hair is given her for a covering or a veil. Her hair is her covering. Verse 16, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. The point being, there was no argument on hair amongst the apostleship. There was no argument on hair amongst any of the other churches that Paul had established. One more thing about the angels. The angels respect order. We know that a third of the angels followed Lucifer. Two-thirds always stayed faithful to God. Long uncut hair for women, short hair on men speaks to the angels concerning our following the God order. And it causes them to stand up and take notice. Not going to follow them. We're going to follow that one that's doing things right. I'm preaching tonight about order. We must have order Friends, this word of God is the thing that gives us direction on being in order with God. So you say, I want to accomplish the will of God in this world. I want to reach souls, be in order with God. Just come into subjection to God. Say, God, I want to please you. I want to make you happy. I want to bring joy to you, Lord. It's not so much about me. I'm going to be blessed, but, but Lord, it's about you. If I will bless you, Lord, then, then you will bless me exceeding abundantly above all I could ask or think, Lord God. If I will just come under subjection to you, God, no telling what you will do for me. Anybody want to be blessed of the Lord? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, Brother Sarton, I don't like some of the things that the Word of God has to say to me. Well, I'll tell you what, I think most people feel that way. But you know what? If God's Word, it just gives us clear-cut direction on things. If God's Word gives us direction, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to submit to that Word. Let all things be done decently and in order. We put our, when we put ourselves under the God order, there can any, there, nothing else can follow us but the blessing of the Lord. And, and friends, I must have God's favor. 
especially in this old wicked and adulterous world in which we live. Hallelujah. You look back at, you know, some of the guys that got off track. You look at, again, you know, you look at Jonah. I mean, he decided to do things his way, and you know what he, God did with him? He put him in a place where he was going to conform. And so I don't want God to have to put me into places where, where I have to conform. I just want to say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Because I want to be something that you can use. I want to be someone that you can use. More than anything else, I've got to be usable in my life. Hallelujah. Why don't you lift your hands right now and say, Lord, use me. Lord, use me. Lord, just use me. God, lead me to somebody that's hungry for you, God. Lead me to somebody that needs that needs ministering in their life, Lord. And, and Lord, I will be what you want me to be to them, God. Lead me to somebody that's lonely, somebody that's empty, somebody that's walking through this world not knowing where they are going to go, not knowing how they're going to live, looking at life and saying, Lord, there's nothing in this world that's giving me any peace. And, and so, Lord, I need to find peace. But, but, Lord, use me. Send me to somebody. Let my example, Lord God, live to be something that when people see it, Lord, Lord, they want a little bit of what I've got. I plead the blood on each of your people tonight, God. Let us be submitted vessels, God. God, you are a God of order. And Lord, we're going to submit to that order. In Jesus' name, let's all stand. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, I've talked to you about some things tonight. You say, well, Brother Sarton, I don't know about all that hair stuff. Well, let me tell you. I've got something here that will add to what I've preached tonight. If you will read through this, every question that you've got that has been presented in this message tonight, I promise you it'll be answered in this. I had Sister Kelly come by today and pick these up from me. I think I've got 50 copies of these. And if you don't understand hair issues, come and get you a copy of this, and it will help you to better understand, okay? All right, Lord, I pray your blessing, your favor on these, your people, God. I pray that you'll lead us, Lord, in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Help us to grow in your divine presence, your divine spirit. Let us become everything, Lord, that you want us to be. In Jesus' precious name, and everybody said amen.